Hey, Keel, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you? I'm fine. How about yourself? I'm doing well. All right. Well, you've got a really interesting business. So let's go ahead and dive right in. Tell me about your business, your company that you're building, Umbri Rain Gear. Yeah, so Umbri is a stylish, uh, smart apparel that we started about four years ago, uh, shortly after my trip to, our, uh, to the Middle East with, uh, with the United States Army. So uh, the company, I, I founded a company on the premise that I would make fashionable umbrellas, durable umbrellas, and something that's fun. So uh, in, the, in the past year, we started making umbrellas and ponchos that change colors when it gets wet. Okay. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. So tell me, I mean, I guess we all know about umbrellas. We've all used them at some point in our lives. What is the specific problem that you solve for the people that you serve? Because I mean, guess, I'm guessing there was a reason why you decided you could do umbrellas better. <laughs> yeah. So when I got into the industry of making umbrellas, I always saw that, you know, the umbrellas have been around a hundred plus years and no one was doing anything innovative with umbrellas. So I wanted to be that guy that created some products that were innovative or, uh, or or it would change the game, right? And it just so happened that when I started the company, no one was doing anything creative. Now there's like four or five companies that are popping up, <laughs> changing the game within umbrellas. I'm like, why? Why did you guys try to do jump into this now? Uh, but you know what we do differently is that we we're making fashion umbrellas uh, that could, you could basically uh, carry at any time to match your outfit. We're also making umbrellas that are fun and exciting for kids that changes colors when it gets wet. So if you can imagine uh, taking a Walt Disney character like Mickey Mouse and putting an umbrella and Mickey Mouse was wearing a black like, a blue cape. And then when it starts to rain, it changes and it changes colors into a red cape. Uh, kids love that stuff. And uh, I think that's what's really exciting about what we're doing today. Adults love that stuff, too. I know I do. <laughs> It sounds super cool. I gotta go give me an umbrella. All right. Well, what yeah, made it's pretty what made you decide that you were gonna be the one to really shake up this 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 industry that's been around for like you said over a hundred years? Um. So, what made me decide? So my story is very unique, and it goes back to even before I started this company. Um, the reason why I got into umbrellas is I actually started a company prior to this, making lingerie. Uh, for curvaceous women, and the goal was I wanted to be the I wanted to bridge the gap between uh, Victoria's Secret and Lane Bryant. There's a lot of sexy, beautiful women out there that are plus size women, and wanted to wear Victoria's Secret type uh, lingerie, but didn't have a location or place they could go. Lane Bryant and Ashley Store makes lingerie for curvaceous women, but they didn't lingerie where it was sexy enough to feel sexy. And I wanted to be that guy that bridged the gap. What I realized is that I needed like a hundred million dollars to really build that company out like I wanted to build it out. Um, so I realized I had to take a step back and create a second product that I could actually sell that was easier to sell, easier to make, and I could sell it to retail stores. And I came up came up with the idea of making umbrellas. Oh, wow. Um, so that's how <laughs> Umbri was started. That is uh, even fascinating. With um <laughs> Yeah, it's a fascinating story. Uh, it, it goes into deeper than that. Just by when we created the name, uh, the umbrellas, we called it Summer Blossom because we wanted to make long umbrellas for women that, you know, just women only. Mm -hmm. And a lot of guys were like, hey, we love your umbrella, man, but I can't carry around a Summer Blossom umbrella. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that's how we had, we had to change the name. We changed the name from Umbri. To umbra, umbra, we changed the name from Summer Blossom to Umbri and Umbro. Umbro for men, Umbri for women, and um, Umbro turned out to be an international soccer brand okay. that um, international soccer brand that you know we can use. So we end up going just adding the extra e to Umbri and just calling it Umbri, <laughs> and it became Unisex. Wow, that is quite the journey. Oh my goodness. Well, I mean, well, clearly you've got a lot of different experiences as an entrepreneur. So this is a perfect place to switch gears a little bit to talk more about um, what more about what that journey has been like. Because, like you said, you started originally with a different idea, and then you kind of made your way over here with the umbrellas. So tell me, and over the life of your career as an entrepreneur, what was the biggest barrier and mindset that you encountered that limited your success in any kind of way, and how did you overcome it? 
Um, I think the biggest challenge that I've experienced is um, is penetrating the market in the in the retail space. You know, there's a lot of retailers out there. A lot of them, you know, look at you as a young company. They don't want to be. They this these are these are some of their excuses. Is that they can't be more than thirty percent of your revenue. They can't be your first company, first major retail company to take you on uh, because of your size. Uh, they want to know that you have experience doing this, but it's like it's like it's like a double-edged sword. How do I get the experience without you giving me an opportunity, right? Right. Uh, so right. those are some of the challenges that we faced, and it took. And a lot of them wanted to see that you're selling to at least at least one more major retailer before they actually t- even consider talking to you. Mm-hmm. So those mm-hmm. were some of my early uh, issues. Then when we got Walmart on board um, in 2015, and when I when we were in, having those discussions, oh, you're selling to Walmart, okay. Well, how many of you selling to Walmart? What are you doing with Walmart? Then the conversation changes, and now they're interested. Now it's like, hey, send me some stuff from your company, and it's like Walmart is like essentially like our our savior because you know without them, it's kind of like hard. You know, we sell to a lot of organizations that are Fortune 500 companies, but mm-hmm. they want to know what other retail stores are you selling to to for them to talk to you. It's like nobody wants to be the first one to give you an opportunity, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So- yeah, and that's the challenge. So how did you, did you have a background in retail? I know you said when you started, you wanted to do the line of lingerie, but did you have a background in retail or anything like that to where you knew how to talk to these suppliers or have you just been figuring it out as you've gone along? No, actually I didn't. I come from an IT background, 15 years in IT. Um, I started off in high school um, in computer science class and went on to get my bachelor's degree working and Joined, I joined the Army after high school, so I went on to, in the Army to do that, as well as I worked for companies like Dell, uh, Apple, Best Buy, Geek Squad, and home theater, home, home theater installation companies, um, Comcast, you know, companies like that that had a, a, some kind of, you know, touch with technology, and, and I've been in technology all, pretty much my whole life, okay. up until the point where I actually got back from Iraq, and I decided to, you know, quit my government job as an IT analyst to start in this company um, from ground up in, in, in products completely different from each other. <laughs> IT to products is to- totally different. Absolutely. So given your background and in your experiences, like you said, all that time in IT, all their time working in government, um, you know, over in the military, what was, how did you go about the process of learning the marketing side of the business. So all this product development, distribution, having these sales conversations, you know, these are very different from, I imagine, from IT. So how did you go about becoming proficient in these and learning out how to do it so you could grow this business? Because, you know, like you said, $100 million target, that's a big deal. So how do you, how do you get there? Um, so every every part of the process has been a learning experience uh every single portion of the um being a business owner in the cons- in a good consumer goods space or retail space it's a learning process uh coming from it where everything was uh, zeros ones and zeros going to products where you have like you said you have the you have the manufacturing portion you, you have the uh, logistics you have distribution you have sales all that ties into it uh the, the retail cycle, but I had to learn it step by step. You know, I had to figure out how do I uh, how do I import something from China. You know, what do I have to do to get that to be able to import on my own without UPS or without FedEx? Mm-hmm. And that was a learning curve by itself. You have to you know get you got to get a continuous bond or a one time bond to be able to import something. You have to go through U.S. Customs or you have to get a custom broker. You know, to help you with that stuff. That was a learning process by itself. Then, you know, from the sales side of things, how do I reach Walmart? How do I reach Target? How do I get to Kohl's? You know, how do I get to these buyers that are buying from these large retailers, um, buying products on the market? And that's that was a learning curve, and that was like that. That takes tactic and strategy. You can't. You have to be creative with that. You can't just say try to call their one hundred number like and try to talk to them. Sometimes you could do that, you know, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. That keeping it simple by just calling the one one eight hundred number will get you further than actually trying to friend request someone on LinkedIn. Okay. You know, so 
you know, you had to do a lot of that stuff. You know, you have to be creative in your tactics that you do, everything that you do. So that's how I was able to get something to these retailers. Got it. So let's talk about your habits because you just brought in some of the other, like there's, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking, I'm getting overwhelmed a little bit also thinking about all these different things. Like you said, how do I import things from China? How do I get with these, connect with these buyers? How do I actually create a product? And of course, I'm just guessing, get it patented and all those other kind of things. Yeah. Um, are there are there any specific habits that you have, and I'm assuming maybe you do so to your military background, that help you keep everything organized and figure out how to maybe compartmentalize or do the things that you need to do to be able to make all these things happen? Because it's a lot. <laughs> it, it, it is a lot. Um, so what I typically do, um, uh, some of my habits, I started trying – trying to manage myself and time management. One of my biggest pains is time management. I feel like there's not enough time in a day to do all the things I want to do. And if I take one day off, my emails goes from like 10 to 80. You know, so um, so how I organize things is I use Google cal calendars to track all my uh, appointments okay. and conferences okay. and uh, conference calls. I also... Oh. Um, then I also, what I also do is um, I track everything in Asana. Um, I use Asana to track project management. Okay. I also, um, what else? I I try to, I, I work best at night. So most of the emails, I, I try to respond to people at night via email. Mm -hmm. And then during the day, I try to manage my projects during the day. So that's how I operate. So there's sometimes there's a long days, and uh, unfortunately, uh, it's it's overwhelming at times. But it, uh, one other thing I would say about that is, I'm a, I'm a big believer of uh, letting professionals be professionals mm -hmm. and not try to be the jack of all trades. Okay. Uh, and a, a lot of times, as small business owners, because we're uh, lack we lack in capital. We try to do everything ourselves, and which over, takes over our business essentially. So I try to. I, I brought on two equity partners, people that I, uh, people or friends, not really friends, but guys I met along the way that I felt like had similar traits and um, mindsets like myself. Mm -hmm. um, I brought them on as equity partners to offload some of the tasks and duties that I would normally have by myself, okay. and and I also. Um, I use third party, like um, I let I, I hired a CPA to do our accounting, uh, hired a lawyer to do all the legal stuff. So I try not to do that stuff myself. That way, let them be professionals, let them handle it. They know it better than I do. I'm not going to try to be my own CPA or my own accountant and because I don't have time for that. I, I should be out there making money. Right. How do you decide? Because that's a really good point. A, a lot of times entrepreneurs will try to we, we'll try to do everything ourselves, but one, we're not experts at everything, and two, there's just not enough time to do it all. So how did you decide um, which tasks you're going to outsource? Lawyer, accountants, book bookkeeping, things like that make great sense. But how do you decide this is something that I'm going to try and do and I can figure it out versus this is something that I just need to go and hire a professional and let them do their thing? So I, I one of the things that I took on early on, I learned, from uh, HubSpot, believe it or not. Um, HubSpot is a uh, marketing platform. One of the things that they sent out was like, uh, he sent, uh, one of the guys, one of their bloggers sent out a uh, tool and it's a Google extension or Google Excel form. And it basically allows you to put your task in this um, Excel. Mm -hmm. And basically mm -hmm. you rank it from um, most important to least important. And it been, then it categorizes it in four quadrants, your task in four quadrants. These are things that are most important that I got to get done myself or got to get done now. And these are the least amount of things that I got to do um, that are not as important, but I could outsource it and, ta and, uh, um, and allocate it to someone else. So I started using that tool to kind of like um, manage myself. And as a result, I learned how to, uh, what do you call it? What's the word for it? It's off to my tongue. Um, delegate yeah. uh, to my business partners the tasks that I felt like were least important to the business. Uh, so that's the tool I use. Um, and it helped a lot. So to the point where now I know without having to use the, the Excel form, I know how to you know 
keep myself busy and and what I, what tasks do I delegate to other people? That's a good point. All right. So how do you stay connected to your customers and what their needs are? Because it sounds like you've got a couple of different customers. You've got the end user and you also got your supply, not the suppliers, your, your buyers, right? So how yeah. do you stay in tune to what their needs are so that you are able to appropriately deliver on it for them? Yeah, so we have like four revenue models. Um, one is retail stores, retail and big box stores. The second is corporate organizations that want to market their brand in a unique way using umbrellas. Uh, and then we have uh, universities and colleges where we're doing collegiate sports um, umbrellas. Um, and then the last category is uh, digital or online sales, which is the general consumer market. Mm -hmm. Um, the people that are going to buy an umbrella off online or on walmart.com or any of the websites that we sell on or amazon.com um so with, with the consumers it's hard to stay in contact with them because each one is an individual sale um, but with our corporate clients we contact them we make sure that they like the product that they receive and that is a product that they will continue buy and we in an initial conversation we always try to figure out what's their objective what what are they trying to achieve by doing putting their logo on an umbrella or skin your they're getting their umbrellas out there um and we we really try to make sure that we we pride ourselves on quality and and the customer first mm -hmm. because we believe that that's going to ultimately affect our business long term wise um it might open up large, bigger doors um if we make sure that the product is quality it's at a good price point and the customer loves it okay so do you do sort of just learn more about what it is that they need through just con ongoing interaction and communication with yeah. them is that what it is yes that's what it is uh, we uh, most of the, m most of what we provide to them is just because of our conversations with them and then sometimes which is really unique um, what we do if we're pitching a, com a new company let's say we're pitching uh see here let's say we pitch on walt disney we create samples blindly mm -hmm. without any request from the client and then we show them the value of why they would want our umbrella or why they would want this product in their store or you know company okay so a lot, a lot of that is you know, just blind pitching them so but there's something to be said about doing that and um, the results that you can start to get as a result. Because everything doesn't always happen where things come to you, which is always ideal. But sometimes you got to go out and hunt a little bit, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, I believe that's. I believe that very much so. I, I think that you could, you can't wait for someone to give you an opportunity. You have to make that opportunity happen yourself. So, did you realize that from the beginning or was there a certain point in this journey that made you say oh wait i gotta go out and get this stuff <laughs> um in the beginning we were calling and calling and, and cold calling but when we, we didn't start seeing success until we started creating the, the digital samples okay. like fully customizing their umbrella creating digital samples and sending it to them via email or through linkedin and then they found the interest to be like, oh, that's cool. And, you know, I've never seen that before. Or that's a cool way to use our, you know, our brand. And that would be cool to give out to our customers or something like that. So that's how these conversations were developed. And it's because we created those sample designs. Okay. Very good. What would you say are your three keys to success? Um, uh, I would say persistence, not giving up. Because, you know, they say if you can fail it out last three to five years within business, you can you're gonna make it you know some a lot of companies give up um, before they make it uh, too soon and too early if something doesn't go right within the first six months you give up you know and you're not gonna last so for us we try to no matter what you know, rain or shine we're gonna no pun intended but <laughs> you have it, right uh, so that's one and number two for me it's about action you know a lot of people want to do a lot of things they say they're gonna do they want to do this they want to do this they want to change they want to, even New Year's resolution. You want to, you want, you want to go back, getting back into the gym, you know. But without going to the gym, it's never going to change. You're never going to change your your ways. You're never going to change your body. You're never going to change your health. So for me, it's about action. So when I ha in my office, I have this on the board. We have action. You know, it starts with action. Uh, from there, from there, everything falls in line. You know, and then three, um, do something that you love to do. You know, 
I think a lot of us, especially minorities and blacks, I think we we tend to do things that things that pays the bills because we we are fear of the unknown. Um, so I encourage uh, young blacks, minorities to get into business and start their own business, do something that they love to do. So if you want to be a photographer, yes, there's creative ways how to be a photographer and that you make money from. Um, so for me, that's what it comes down to is like just doing something that you're passionate about. A lot of people, when they meet me for the first time, they're like, I've never met someone that loves, uh, like makes umbrellas. You're the first. <laughs> I'm like, hey, I love doing, I love making umbrellas. <laughs> so for me, that's what it is. Very good. No, I like all those. And it does, it makes sense. Um, and I think your last three, well, they're all connected really, but your last, your first and your third really do kind of help when you have the passion, it makes it easier to not give up and to be persistent, yeah. you know, yeah, being persistent and, and not giving up. That's a very, it's, a, I think it's key. For sure. For sure. All right. Well, where can people find you if they want to learn more about you? If they want to buy an umbrella and match their outfit or. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, um, we're in the middle of rebranding right now. Um, when we got into Walmart, you know, we decided to, I, it's a couple of things that happened. Um, I talked to one of the former vice president of Macy's Florida, and he said that um, if you sell to Walmart or Target or any of those other stores like that, we can't buy your product. You know, it's just, it would just devalue our brand. Yeah. Um, so we, we created a second brand uh, called Simply Umbre. Uh, for you know stores like Walmart, Target, and stuff like that. So okay. we're in the process of rebranding right now. Okay. But we have a, our, our largest shipment of umbrellas coming from China in July. Okay. They will be on our website at www.umbre.com, as well as they will be on Walmart.com, Amazon.com, and uh, OpenSky.com. Um, so you could purchase an umbrella in July, preferably from Walmart.com. Uh, <laughs> Preferably from Walmart.com when they, when we have this uh, when when we restock, um, and then hopefully in 2017, I mean 2018, you will find an Umbre umbrella in every Toyota in the U.S. because that's our goal. So Toyota, if you're listening, let's make this deal happen. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they're listening, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. For sure. Oh, Kiel, this has been awesome. Thank you again for stopping by and sharing your experiences um, and your journey with us. It's been great. Yeah. I want to thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. I actually never did one of uh, podcast before, so it's awesome. <laughs> oh, good. Well, before I do have, since you're enjoying it, good. Uh, I do have one other question for you, and that's to deliver a line from a movie that speaks to you and explain why you chose that one. Help us to dig inside your mind a little bit more. Um. Oh man, that's funny. Uh, it's my my favorite movie is Gladiator, right? Okay. But I have no sayings from that movie. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Um. Oh man. I I can I lost words right now. <laughs> put, me on, put me on the spot. I would have to think of one. But I, I get to have an, have me back on your podcast, and I'll have one ready for you for, for next sure. time. For sure. Well, do you, do you have like a, a favorite quote, or maybe from a song, or something like that? Uh, well, I have a I have a, I have a quote, okay. and I feel like I want to go down in history book for saying it. I'm not the first. I don't know if I'm the first person that ever said it, but I, I live by it. I, I I tend to believe that uh, people people don't change; they just alter their behavior based on their current situation. So if if it was if it was meant for you to act a certain way your whole life, you know, there's a lot of things in studies that says, you know, addicts and drug and people that are addicted to drugs don't change or they they can be changed. But I don't, I, I honestly believe that people don't change. They just alter the behavior based on their situation. And I feel like for me, I feel for a lot of us that like when we're put in certain situations, we adapt to the situation. We don't really change. I think our values and beliefs still are still within us. Mm -hmm. So and so that's one of my little sayings that I, I say to my friends and stuff like that. Right. So <laughs> I, I kind of like that because I guess as an entrepreneur, entrepreneurship teaches you what you're made of. Right. So it's yeah. not like you change to become an entrepreneur. You're just tapping into probably 
areas of your personality um, mm -hmm. that you m might have hidden or they might have just been sort of dormant for a little while, but they were always there. You're just starting to wake them up yeah. a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I, and that's what it is. Like, you know, so like if you think about like for you, let's say if you're a person that always, uh, if you were really a good note taker in class when you was a kid, you, over time you're going to be great at note taking because that's your that's who you are. But you can certainly adapt new traits and take on new traits to, to adapt to your situation. So if, if you became, uh, let's say, student body president and you're not good at uh, public speaking, yes, you would develop that as a trait. But you're still going to always be a good note taker. You're still going to be you're still going to be uh, um, you're still going to be like, what's the word for it? Uh, you're going to be good at organization and, and that's what you do well, but you're still going to adapt new traits, but ultimately you're still going to be wholesome from where, what you develop as a kid. So I feel like that's what, what it comes down to is that you're just adapting as you move along. So Great. Well, very good. Thanks again, Keel, for stopping by. This has been loads of fun. All right. Thank you for having me and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. You too.